Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Infosec's third morning tech. My name is Per Silva Hansen, and I'm responsible for the part of Infosec that is non-technical. We call it Strategic Cyber Risk Advisory. While I'm uh, trying to share my screen here, you might notice that the background and the setting is not the same as uh, the previous uh, morning techs. This is because I'm uh, working from my home today. I was in a skiing accident last week, and uh, that means that we had to manage a lot of risk of this webinar, not uh, falling out of sound or being black uh, or something in that uh, neighborhood. So that means that we have a team of people in Copenhagen that has worked all morning to help me, and I hope that the setting is uh, is well. I have a phone here so that people can message me if uh, everything goes uh, wrong, and that is also uh, somehow managing a risk. So in uh, in our department, we believe that having an open dialogue about what is a risk, what can go wrong, and discussing it in the room of decision makers is uh, the most important uh, element of risk management. That's why the today's webinar will not be technical. It will be focused on getting people to understand how uh, you can connect the very operational and technical elements of security into a decision-making forum so that everybody can have the right picture of what are the threats, what are the risks, and tying the operational security elements with the decisions that needs to be done. We also strongly believe that the purpose of risk management is actually to plan and act. So the focus must be on the mitigating actions in a risk, not uh, having the right models and uh, so on and so forth. That is less of, a, uh, of an importance. So before we, we continue, uh, I know that there's uh, well over 100 people joining this webinar, and that is really, really good. I hope that you have a lot of questions for me. I will answer them the best way I can in the end of this webinar. And uh, so please just uh, type your questions in the chat. Let's uh, move on. And I again apologize. I only have my left arm to work with today, so things might go a little bit slower than, than uh, when in the studio. I would like to address some of the challenges that we face in when advising risk management, but also in my own experience. And uh, what are the typical boundaries in order to bridge the security operational technical elements into the boards that has to make the decisions in the company? So often, not always, but often decision makers do not understand security. I've seen a positive trend in the board of directors and the managing boards wanting to talk about security, but it's still something that can be unclear to them and uh, they don't understand uh, what it is. It can be too nerdy of a language and they are talking in a completely different language. So we need to bridge that gap. Also, uh, I've seen a lot of cyber uh, reporting. I've made the mistakes myself. Some of the cyber risk or cyber uh, security reportings contain too many details. Again, if you present too many details in an early language to a bot that doesn't understand it, you're not bridging the gap. You're not making the people understand what this is all about, which is something that we must address. Besides that, or to even worsen the problem, um, especially on the high decision level uh, um, um, in, in a company, especially all, also on the board of directors, they don't know what questions to ask because they don't talk the nerdy language, but uh, they also have a responsibility when they know that something is wrong, they need to act on it. So how do they actually ask the right questions to the security functions or to the uh, heads of IT in order to, um, to talk about this uh, subject properly uh, so that they're able to make decisions and do the right things? Lastly, on top of that, uh, security functions 
often also don't know how to present the many challenges that uh, that security uh, um, contain in a, in a very simple way. I have seen a lot of examples where there's again too many details, but some of the people also struggle with presenting what are the most important elements and how can you actually present this in a non-technical and very simple way so that the subject can be discussed, the risk can be identified and the actions can be planned. So those are obstacles that uh, we need to address and fortunately risk management uh, is able to do that, is able to bridge that gap with the right structure, with the right planning. Let me start out with uh, the last uh, challenge that is uh, one of the worst of them all. Uh, understanding what is a risk can actually be something that is hard, to, uh, can, can be very hard. So what is a threat and what is a risk? And um, if you look at this uh, line of examples, you can see that there is a cause and an effect. And uh, these are examples of, uh, of uh, something that could be described as risks but where would you describe the risk? And if you were to think about the, the, the decision makers, where you perhaps are part of that group, how would you describe a cyber risk? If you go from the left-hand side, you might have a lack of controls or you have weak technical controls. Is that a risk? Because in this example, you have weak technical controls, it could lead to a phishing uh, event. The phishing event again could lead to a ransomware attack. So what is the risk? Is the risk a phishing event or a ransomware attack? The consequences of those uh, events could be a breakdown in the crown jewel systems. In this example, the uh, ERP system, where again, this company is unable to evaluate the goods in the warehouse um, or even uh, what the goods do we have in transition breaking up the supply chain. Again, it can be hard to describe. The point is not to, uh, is, is not to find the exact uh, right event and call it ransomware or breakdown in, our, in ERP systems. The point of this is to figure out how figure out a common understanding of what does a risk uh, entail and how to describe that. With a little, uh, with a little help, you can put uh, some structure into this and uh, breaking this into the right elements, you will be able to have a dialogue uh, with the decision makers about this. And when I mention decision makers, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily it needs to be a managing board or a board of directors. Depending on your organization, the risk mandate or the risk ownership can be placed different in the organization. In this example and also the examples going forward, uh, the examples would fit in a company that is of a certain size, but you can simplify the risk dialogue even in a very small company, even if you have a, a, a web shop that, uh, and you are only a, a handful of people. You still have risks and uh, dealing with them and talking about them in order to make the right actions is something that is possible for everybody. So putting the structure into this uh, dialogue you can see from the left hand side the uh, the line from the previous uh, slide you can see that the phishing and ransomware i'll put them in as uh, as threats uh, to some event that could happen and the event in this example are large delays or downtime in crown jewel systems this wording is something that i have chosen the wording that you should choose should fit the, the, the language in your company and also the culture in your company. So again, everybody understands what are we talking about. The worst thing that can happen in a risk dialogue is people having different uh, perceptions of what the risk is, because then the mitigations and also preventions to that risk 
might be very different and you you might not hit the the right uh, elements uh, of planning on the right side you can see uh, after the event has uh, happened there will be consequences uh, to the company in uh, in my case uh, personally just to give that example i have wore a helmet and a shield for my back but i was uh, ran down by a skier i cannot guarantee that nothing will happen on uh, when 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 skiing downhill i was mitigating to the best effort possible but still again i had consequences and risk management is about taking chances it's not about guaranteeing that nothing will happen if you mitigate it so the level of zero risk is not the, the goal in itself, it's the awareness of should something happen that we don't want to happen, uh, then uh, we deal with it the best way possible. Looking back on the threats on the left hand side, we can plan actions to prevent, we can prepare, we can put in technical controls, we could, for example, vulnerability management or we could separate our networks we could do active director active directory tiering or other elements uh, this as you know is a very broad area to prevent that this event will happen without guarantees should you on the other hand be the victim of an attack the consequences also very much uh, um, is affected on the, the 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 ability for you to recover, and that could be a, a handy backup if you will have a ransomware event. Those uh, backups come in nice and handy often, but it could also be that uh, that you have a crisis management or disaster recovery. How fast are you actually able to recover from this event? And putting all of these into a structure makes it easier to talk about and also lessens uh, the confusion about the risk. So going further, I wouldn't present this in a, in a board. I would uh, use some more specific uh, text and also uh, exemplify even further. And uh, this example is uh, one example of how you can present uh, one risk in a page. You could have uh, more risks uh, uh, pr presented in a board. You could also present uh, several risks in one risk matrix uh, for, for discussion. If you start out with a risk management process, this could be a, a good uh, startup, um, a good way of starting the discussion in one overview. I'll try to walk you through it. You have a, a you have a, a risk description on the left hand side. Describe the event. I deliberately aggregated the text to a high level here. Uh, this is because people that don't understand the nerdy language often understand this language more. But you could also split this up if you see this as multiple risks into multiple descriptions. In this case, the large delay or downtime in crown jewel systems could lead to a significant loss and uh, so on and so forth. I also exemplify what are the crown jewels so that it's not all of the systems, but it's specific systems that are the most important to the company. Then I try to describe the root causes or the threats. Um, and in this case, a very generic text describing that a sophisticated attack could occur and it could uh, overload uh, an e-commerce site or it could bring down uh, the, 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 the crown jewel systems. Again, if you want to specify even further, you can see the relevant attack vectors, a ransomware and a DDoS attack. They are two very different threats and they can also can have different consequences to the company. I chose to, to aggregate this for the sake of the example, but you could also make two different risks if you find that necessary. One cause can have several consequences and 
one consequence can also be uh, be imp impacted by several uh, causes. You have to find the middle ground and uh, practice on that. So the next I describe the potential consequences or the impact to the company in a text so that it is conceptually understood, not in a te technical way, not in numbers, not, at, not in it can cost this and that amount of money. The impact scales uh, that belongs to a risk matrix, uh, I haven't put them in here. That is too many details typically in, a, in an overview like this, but you can have that in the background. Just as you could have a threat catalog uh, in the background, uh, uh, but not presented here. On the right hand side, I have a simple overview with the risk matrix. With on the vertical horizon is the impact and the horizontal, horizontal uh, axis is the likelihood. And uh, I have in the in the top right corner the net risk symbolizing the N. This is to show this is where we are with today with the actions that we are already doing. A suggestion also here is to move the risk into the bullet A, which symbolizes the risk appetite. So this is uh, to suggest that with even further actions, we can move the risk to this level. And then the, the discussion needs to go on. Is this enough or should we do even further elements or, uh, or actions? That is the point of, 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 this, uh, of this presentation. On the bottom, I just show some examples on current mitigative actions that resembles the net risk and the planned actions that resembles the appetite. You could see on example number three in the bottom, I have the vulnerability management. I also gave it a little grade that says it's actually very weak. We have it, it's not fully automized, it's not followed up, uh, and nobody is really acting upon it. In this case, so an action could be to create a project that says we need to improve this uh, further. Good. One of the elements that I also often are asked about is what is the risk appetite and what is the risk tolerance? This is something that people uh, get confused of uh, a lot of times and do we need to work with both or do we need to to define this what is it actually and as long as you question what it is uh, and don't understand it uh, then that uh, fills up the dialogue and I would rather that the dialogue uh, should be uh, spent on what can we do about the risk so just to clarify and put a few examples on it the risk appetite is the topmost amount of risk on a broader level, uh, typically over a year uh, or maybe even longer. What are we willing as a company to accept should it happen? What is the maximum appetite that we can live with should we be uh, the victim of an attack or should the IT systems go down in, uh, in another way? or should the data be uh, be exposed or something like that. Well, risk tolerance is a factor on an operational level and often something that you can measure per event. So using those two or just either one of these is something that can help you spark the discussion uh, of where do we want to go? Are we doing enough in the security efforts? I can see that uh, that questions are already coming in and I thank you for that. Please just uh, continue with asking me questions. I will answer them the best way I can in, uh, in the end. To put examples on uh, risk appetite and risk tolerance, I have a, a few here. Um, if we look at uh, financial impact, risk appetite could be that we are losing 
uh, we are losing all of the profits for a year. This is not something that is wanted in any way, of course, but should should it happen, it it might be acceptable. But in this case, uh, loss uh, loss that represents two years of profit might take down the company, and that is not uh, something that is, is is tolerable. So if that is the case, you need to deal with the risk so that the maximum uh, impact is uh, at this acceptable level. On the risk tolerance, it could be that you lost uh, 100,000 uh, in uh, per event. And these, these are two, tip, two different ways of measuring this. In a risk context, I have seen uh, companies that work with uh, both elements and also companies that worked with only one of those, and both are both are OK. Again, the having a common understanding of how to deal with the threats that pose this risk and also planning for action are the most important elements. The risk tolerance often uh, are easier to measure than the risk appetite. So there's also an advantage there. On the regulatory com and compliance uh, impact, it could be that uh, a company is uh, losing a license uh, example for, uh, for, for, for selling in a country. That is not acceptable, and that is the maximum uh, that can be tolerated or can uh, be accepted. Whereas a few warnings from authorities are something that we want, but it's not something that brings down the company. Again, what can be tolerated and what can be not be tolerated. And the point of, of the risk again is doing enough so that you can accept the remaining risk, not having any guarantees. On the reputation side, it could be exposure in the media for a longer period of time, um, uh, whereas a local uh, newspaper or, uh, could, could have a, a small effect not bringing down the uh, company, not bringing shame to the entire uh, company or, or, or losing uh, new investors or whatever that could bring, but something that is tolerable and you can measure per event. That's the difference between those two. So, Going back to the points uh, of risk uh, management, also um, what what I usually talk about with uh, when, when I advise in uh, in risk uh, management, establish the dialogue with the decision makers. It could be the managing boards or the board of directors. It could also be if you have a larger organization with a larger complexity, that the risk ownership and the decision uh, mandate lies elsewhere figure out where that is. Seek that before you dive into uh, deep uh, technical uh, or methods of uh, making the risk management the right way. It is about people getting together to discuss what it is about and also how to act upon it. And then be specific and honest. Again, this is something that is uh, not fun to uh, to realize that, uh, that that can happen to a company, but it is necessary. It is what it is. And having the dialogue about an honest dialogue about where are you weak in the company uh, in terms of security efforts? Where are you strong? What are your threats? And uh, what is relevant for you and what is not relevant for you? That discussion is, 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 is handy to have. And that discussion is some of the first discussions that I facilitate when I uh, build uh, risk functions. And then again, instead of buying a, a, a new uh, risk management system that can cater for a lot of uh, measurements, make it simple and focus on the action. Make it simple and focus on the dialogue and establish that before you decide on what to do further. 
a very important uh, takeaway also, uh, and at least in, in my experience, has been to ensure that the stakeholders are on board. And I don't mean just the decision makers. I also mean the specialists that has to uh, uh, that has to improve the technical vulnerabilities or or to um, or to increase the security level in uh, in the organization because they they also need to understand what is the risk here what are being decided and talked about at the higher levels in the organization so that you can create this uh, line of uh, of uh, of uh, communication in the organization they will all be your supporters and if they don't understand what you're talking about they don't commit so focus on committing to on commitment to the process and then lastly seek to bridge the top down and bottom up approach you might have an organization uh, of uh, security already or you might uh, start it you might have some specialists that are operating on a very technical level seek to tie this together with the discussion that is going on in the managing board and the, support, the, and the board of directors. Because when you tie this together, when you first bridge this, this is where you have the best way of discussing, are you doing the right things? Where should you put your resources? Should you increase? Should you even decrease in some areas to focus on other areas? OK, now it's time for questions and I can see that uh, some of them are already uh, popping in and uh, I'm happy about that. I need to pick up my phone and and read them in a minute. So bear over with me. Um, so I have a, a question again. Questions are anonymous, so I won't uh, mention any names. I can't see who asked who asked them uh, actually. Can you define what an advanced attack is? Um, very good question and thank you for that. Um, an advanced attack is uh, a sophisticated attack is where you have a, a group of, uh, of hackers planning out, uh, for, uh, using some time on planning out to, uh, to make an attack um, and then maybe even lurking in your, uh, your systems uh, over time and then uh, setting off the effect that they need to do uh, to put on the maximized pressure. I hope that that uh, answers your question. Otherwise, you are more than welcome to uh, email me afterwards or contact me. You can find my contact information on imposec.com. Uh. So the next question is, if your board or audit committee does not appreciate the term risk appetite or are unwilling to state it, could fault tolerance for critical systems be accepted as a guideline? I think that's a brilliant question because uh, that is typical for, uh, for, uh, for, for also uh, people to, to not want to, to talk about this appetite. Does that mean that you, you welcome the risk? No. And in, in this case, fault tolerance, it's uh, absolutely acceptable again the point is for everybody to have a common understanding of what are we talk about then don't focus on specifically the right uh, terms as long as everyone in the room when discussing risk including you um know what is uh, what 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 uh, is uh, is the point and what is the meaning of this use your own language so thank you very much for that question Next question is also a very good uh, question. Um, can an impact span multiple impact categories? For example, the impact could be low, but it can also uh, likely be high. Uh, yes, that is a, a, a little, yeah, when a, a, a not so simple uh, example, but uh, yes, that is actually a case. You could, uh, when working with risk, you are working with scenarios and those scenarios can actually expand or move from one place to, to the next. Just like when mitigating risk, you want to move the scenario down. Um, the world of dynamics that we live in, 
um, can actually also spin in, in the opposite uh, control. And one effect might have a knock on on effect on others. So yes, um, you can have a scenario that can span over multiple impacts, but I would define them as as moving scenarios or different scenarios. So the next uh, question I have is, uh, how do you get started? And uh, again, I think the most important element for me is to create the discussion. Find the decision makers uh, in the organization that are first willing to discuss this. If, um, if you don't have uh, that much uh, of a speaker time at the boards, then find a sponsor that can do it for on, on behalf of you. But find the people that are willing to discuss the problem um, and discuss it uh, without having any consequences uh, for, for you or anybody else. Just an open discussion of what is the problem. And start out simple. I think that uh, there are more questions here, but I think my, my time is uh, is out. Again, you are more than welcome to email me, to uh, to contact me on the uh, phone. Um, I'll be happy to talk further on risk. The examples I had today was uh, only a, a small version of, uh, of a full process. So, um, so please uh, reach out. Thank you very much for listening in. Um, I just want to mention before we end that the next uh, webinar will be, or the next uh, um, morning tech, will be held by Jakob Petersen. It will be on the 29th of March, and we will go back to uh, technical morning tech because he will talk about the topic of uh, Active Directory tiering, which is, by the way, uh, one of the uh, most effective uh, ways to, to control uh, access nowadays. So I look forward to, to, to hear that. Again, I've heard that from Jakob before, and he uh, he can speak uh, technical in a very simple way. Thank you very much and have a nice day.